Hello everyone, my name is Grayson and welcome to the start of a new series of a game I have not covered yet on this channel, Trials of Fire. Now I did take a look at this game very very briefly for a channel update video where I asked you all to vote on what game you wanted to see next. This game I think received uh, some votes but didn't receive the majority so I'm coming back to it now that I've covered those other ones. So Trials of Fire is a fantasy, tactical, deck building, roguelike game with like heroes and RPG aspects. There's a million of these out there, but I promise you I wouldn't be covering this if I didn't think it was worth your time. It's developed and published by What Boy Games, and it looks like this is their first game, as far as I can tell, uh, their first and only game. So congratulations to the developers and their team for this really fantastic experience. So this is a game where you will go on adventures with like three heroes at a time through a post-cataclysmic wasteland that's filled with all sorts of like dangers and horrors and stuff. The starting pool of heroes you'll choose from will be small. I think it's just three, but as you play, you will unlock additional heroes over time and some other sort of meta progression things that we can show off a little bit later on. So here on the main menu, we have most of the tabs are here, kind of hidden away. Here's where you click in to start your adventure, uh, or if you have one in progress right here. We're going to take a look at these really, really br briefly. There is a combat tutorial, and I highly, highly, highly recommend you play this. I believe it put, tries to put you in that right away if it's your first time playing the game. This will launch you right into a little fairly scripted little combat encounter where they'll teach you all the basics about how to manage your characters and move and defend and attack and spend your resources. The next one is the card catalog. This is a place where you could go in and see all of the different cards in the game. Uh, you can also sort by the different classes. So for instance, if we have the warrior, here are the cards available to the warrior. And so there's basic cards here. You can see basic along the side. And then you'll also get other cards as you level up and you can also sort of empower those cards. And there's all sorts of these different classifications for cards. You don't really have to worry about these at the moment. They're, they're pretty self-explanatory for the most part once you get into a, into a game. Um, there's also items. So items grant powers. And for the most part, you get a lot of skills and abilities from the items that you put on your characters, which is kind of a, a departure from the standard roguelite sort of deck building games where you have a deck and it may be altered a little bit by your gear. But this game, as you can see, like if we go back to the warrior here really quickly, this is the first page. This is the only other page of warrior cards. That's it. It's all of these. You could plan this out pretty well, like what you want to end up with. So you don't get that many choices just from playing the warrior. It's from the gear you're going to get that you get a lot of other choices. Not that there aren't extremely powerful and important things in here, but you're going to get a lot of choices from gear. And obviously every character has different gear available to them. Not everyone can equip a bow and not everyone can equip a, you know, etc. something like that. So we can close out of here. The next tab we have is the statistics. This shows your soul level, which is has to do with your um, runs that you've completed. It also shows your missions played and your units slayed and that kind of stuff. So we can see here like the soul level of my different classes uh, and then the ones I still have locked. We have here uh, the history of my different runs that I've played and stuff like that. This is obviously when I either lost or I quit. Um, and then here's like the different quests I've played and the difficulty that I've done them on. And then here you can see like all the different enemies you've fought. So I fought like tons of rat men. Husks are kind of like zombies in a way. So there's like tons and tons of those, obviously. So we can close back out to the main menu. We also have the codex. Now the codex is a compendium of tool tips, essentially. So if there's ever something you're not quite remembering how it works, you could pop into say gameplay, you know, controls or tutorials and you can see like, oh, you know, I don't remember how some of these things work. And then there's the combat side as well. So you might go into there and be like, oh yeah, I can't remember how you, you know, uh, do like, how does a range attack work? And you can see little tips like, oh, hold right mouse button to preview a line of sight from any space. So very useful little tips in there. Uh, next up, we have the options menu, fairly basic options, not a ton of audio and visual options in fact fairly limited actually gameplay wise there's a few options things like speeding up combat which i leave off i like seeing it and i don't think it takes very long things like knowing what your actions are going to cause to happen and things like the story choice spoilers so you know what your actions are going to do and things like that 
And then there's controls. Um, they're pretty simple controls, and I don't think you can change any of your key bindings, unfortunately. Uh, they're pretty simple. There's not a whole lot you have to know about. You can do almost everything with just the mouse. And then we also have profiles if you want multiple save files, like if you wanted to start a new one for a recording, a series or something, or you wanted, you know, somebody else in your household wanted to play their own, uh, you can do that. You can have multiple profiles. And then, of course, the credits down here if you wanted to see um, the directors and all of those kinds of things as well. Really, really cool. So with the menu stuff out of the way, let's go ahead on into Choose Your Adventure. You can see the whole the whole game actually takes place inside this big book. This is like a codex of, of this world and the Trials of Fire themselves. So what you do is first you go in here and you pick a quest and you can set a difficulty. So I'm just gonna leave it on medium for now. You can set gameplay modifiers down here so you can add all sorts of different stuff like kit it out. So for instance, you can hover over them and see what they do. So for instance, kit it out is your class deck is empty and you cannot gain cards through leveling up. All of your skill cards will come from the equipment you take into battle. You start the adventure with a small cache of items to help you out. So that kind of like makes it harder. And if you enable any of these, it actually disables achievements and leaderboards. So just be aware of that. Uh, but you can sort of change how your uh, game works out, which is pretty, pretty fun. So in here, first we have to pick our quest. So we have lore quests, and then there's like challenge quests. So there's a boss rush mode, there's daily challenges that they put out, there's a seasonal one. But the lore quests themselves are, are not scripted, but they're, they're, they're controlled in a way. There's sort of certain things about them that are sort of set. So you can see here, this is a 90 to 120 minute starter quest. And you've got God Hunter here that might take a, a, a while longer. You hunt down a wrathful deity. Beacon of Hope is only 60 to 90s. It's exploration. Explore the world to find the components you need for an elven beacon. And I've done, I can't remember which of these I've done, but I've done a couple of these. And you can also do the Trial of Fire, which is an infinitely replayable custom quest where the challenges are different every time. Play how you want or compete against your friends. So we might go ahead and do a Trial of Fire and we'll just see how far um, we can get with that. Then you will go into the party and you can choose your three characters. So. Um, when you first start the game, you're going to have this setup like this. You're going to have the warrior, the hunter, and the elementalist. And these characters specialize in different things, and they have special bonuses. So the warrior, for instance, she is a fierce frontline fighter. She specializes in dealing melee damage and defending against incoming attacks. So she's a very sort of your standard fighter bruiser kind of character she can defend she can attack but she doesn't do a whole lot of buffing or protecting anybody else or anything like that she just gets in there and just just beats things up the hunter is your standard ranged user so this character uses a bow and they shoot a lot of um just sort of like piercing arrows or there's even like a ricocheting arrow uh and the hunter can also summon minions um there's a few different creatures you can get that you can summon in like a disturbing looking like bone dog thing and you can i think i was even summoning a ghost in one game i was playing i don't know how, i don't remember how i was able to do that but yeah this guy can summon like minions and they have very very basic um options available to them and they're they're not super tank. You can think of them if you've played, like, say, Gloomhaven, either the board game or the, the virtual game. The minions you summon in Gloomhaven are not... They're either glass cannons or they have a bit of health and don't really do much else. So it's a little bit like that. The hunter can summon things that are useful but don't, don't really rely on them to be his main source of damage or utility. And then the elementalist, I wouldn't think mage or wizard i would think something more like a warlock because she does tend to have to get in close and there's certain setups she needs to accomplish before she can use things she has a fair amount of aoe sort of line attacks or a little circle area of attacks but um, at the same time she does typically have to get kind of close to use her skill so she can put herself in a bit of danger sometimes you have to watch out for that you can also change their names if you want to which is really really cool and you can also uh, change the gender that these characters are referred to uh, in the game, which is a really cool option. You will also go in and you can change the portraits uh, if you'd like to. And you can also change their items. So if we flip on over to the items tab, this character here starts with a bone axe and bone armor. So 
what we can do is we can look for our character. So here's our warrior's portrait. So we could give her different types of starting weapons if we want. Now here she is down here as well. We could give her a heavy weapon, like a bone claymore or a bone axe, or we could give her these blades, like a crude spear or a bone sword. And you can see next to each one of those is a different skill. It costs different amounts, has different effects. And obviously throughout the game, you're going to get new equipment and it's going to change what you have, but you can sort of build from the start a little differently if you want to, which I think is super, super fun. I, I'm i guessing you might unlock more stuff as you go, like harder and like better and better gear, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, so for instance, the Elementalist starts with this, this Shaman Rod that gives the Flame Fans. You can see it's a close range sort of cone of fire, like flamethrower type attack, which is pretty cool. And our hunter here starts with this crude spear, which is a melee attack three or a range attack two. So he can either go in and use it as a melee weapon or he can like throw it as a spear. There are different range weapons you can get later on, like bows and stuff. But at least for the start, he's kind of limited to some of that gear. Now for our party, I think what I've done recently is unlock this alchemist. I've never used him before. He's a ranged damage dealer, master of chaos and random effects, but results can be unpredictable. And he has Tinker. At the start of your turn, upgrade a random card in hand. So if he has a hand full of, uh, or a deck full of cards that aren't very well upgraded, it sounds like it's very possible for him to slowly get more powerful over the course of a battle. Sorry, just got away from my cat to scale my leg. All right. Uh, so I think we'll go ahead and put the Alchemist in. That sounds pretty fun. We're definitely going to want some kind of frontline character. And for that, I would end up choosing probably either the Warlord or the Warrior. The Warlord is more your buff character. So this is like a general of some kind. So she, she goes in and she's really cool. She's like a tiefling. She's got these horns and she's got like hoofed feet and like a tail and stuff. She's awesome. All these characters actually look really awesome. They all look like they've, they've seen some shit out there in the wasteland. <laughs> Well, we got to take either the warrior or the warlord. I think I'd be more comfortable with the warrior because the warlord, she's a support character and she's really good at getting in close and buffing, but she doesn't do a ton of damage on her own. And I find that sometimes she's sitting around not doing enough. So I think I might take the warrior and then maybe like the elementalist as well. So we might be a little bit squishy here, uh, but because we'll have two, two essentially ranged characters, even though she needs to get pretty close. Uh, and one melee. I talked about the alchemist bonus, the tinkerer. So the elementalist has the first card you play each turn costs minus one willpower. And willpower is basically mana. So she, the first card she plays each turn is a little bit more uh, less costly, which is nice. And the warrior has taunt once per turn after you play a card and are adjacent to an enemy, defend two on all other heroes. So that's pretty helpful. So she actually can provide a little bit of defense to her allies just sort of by getting enraged while she's in combat. So let's flip on over to the items tab again. Let's take a look here. I'm not familiar with his starting items. It looks like he can start with uh, basically just these. He's got a crude sling, a flint dagger, or bone knives. Move three, random range attack two. So that's actually pretty powerful. Uh, you don't get to choose who it is, but moving three and attacking is a very powerful combination. Starts with a sling, range attack one, then draw a card. Deal two damage if your previous card played was a move card. Okay, interesting. Maybe we'll stay with that sort of basic equipment. We can also give our elementalist some blunt weapons if we want. She does have to get in close, but I think I like the flame fan. And the axe here is a charge. Move three to target, melee attack two, plus one for each space moved. That seems pretty good, especially because we want her getting in close since she's our only tank character and the character we want closest to everybody else. So down here we have our medium difficulty, our trial of fire, which is our randomly generated quest, and we have our game length standard. So here we'll go ahead and begin the journey. The settlement of Terralyn is dying. Now this is a great feature of this game. You can hover over anything blue to get tons of information. There is so much lore in this game, but if you don't want to delve really deep into all that stuff, you just need to read this and, and move on. But even something like this, the Glasslands, the name given to the barren and scorched wasteland that now covers most of the surface of Ash, which is the planet. The name comes from the beautiful glass formations that were forged in the scorching heat of the cataclysm. Super cool. 
So the settle settlement of Terralin is dying. You must track down the settlement's leader, Naya, who has ventured out into the Glasslands in search of a powerful artifact but has not been heard from for weeks. So we can continue. New objective here, follow in her footsteps. So you can see, again, we're still in this book. We're still in like we've got tabs. Tabs in the book go to the characters, and we can like head over to our journal. We can head over to, to our map page here. Super, super cool. We can see our, our gear and how our party is doing and stuff like that from in here. Really, really awesome how everything fits into this book. And as you travel along, you've got a little mini map here. The world will kind of explore itself as you go. So let's talk really quickly about the UI of the main menu here with the map. So on the map itself, we can see our little party here. We can actually see they've got little standees for the three characters we've chosen. Uh, around here, you can see if it doesn't highlight, it means it's impassable, like these mountains here we can't go into, but we can get pretty close. Uh, here's some sort of scorched forest. We have here a settlement. So you can see there is a... Uh, it's going to cost 3% of our, um, basically like our food here, our stamina, our party stamina to get here. And um, there's a pretty good chance of a shop and a small chance of a battle. Because we could go there and find out that there's, you know, raiders attacking or, you know, somebody thinks there's a bounty on our heads or something. And you never know, you can get these random events, but you have an idea of what the chances are. Uh, down here we have some ruins. It's going to cost us some energy to get there and some stamina to explore. There's definitely a battle. You can see that's filled up all the way. There might be some equipment or some food, and there, there's a small chance of materials. So that's a good place to go to kind of uh, get our feet wet with combat and train our, our new characters up a little bit. Here we have some, gra some glasslands. So this has some materials, but might have a little bit of equipment or food. And over here we have a, um, an unknown node of some kind, some sort of arch here. I don't know what this is actually. Up here we have our party's gold. We have our mystic herbs. These are really important kind of rare resources. They're used when you're meditating to improve a hero's deck. You can do things like take cards out or um, improve cards. And these are also used to uh, heal an injury. So if somebody dies in combat, but you win the combat, they come back, but they have an injury. And that'll be, I think that comes in the form of a, a detrimental card that goes into their deck and kind of clogs it up. Um, I think, I think that's how that works. I, I don't quite remember, but you can use these herbs to get rid of those permanent negatives. We also have here our food supplies. Camping will consume food to recover fatigue and health, or you can drag food directly onto a wounded character to heal just them alone. So if you have a combat where these two characters take absolutely no damage. This character gets completely wailed on and is low on health. Camping might be a waste of your resources because only one person needs the rest. So you can just give them a couple pieces of food and move on and try to push your luck a little bit for the next one. We have here our stamina. So we are in civilization right now. This is some sort of town node that we're starting in, like our village. So if we were to rest here, we would gain health, two health on each character. And you can see they're at 10 out of 10. And we would gain more stamina from resting. If you rest out in the middle of nowhere, it's very inefficient. You don't want to rest like, say, here in the sand or here in the rocks. If you can help it rest in a town or if you can clear out some ruins or something, those are also good for resting in. But the best places are in civilization like here. Uh, we have our morale here. So if we are determined, we get extra armor, card redraws, and we get better gear. So our, our band of heroes right here is they're ready and willing to go on adventures. But as we go longer and longer without resting, they start to lose morale and, and possibly stamina, of course, as well. And so that makes them perform worse in combat, and they may actually start getting like negative cards put into their deck. So you have to rest to, to maintain both their morale and their stamina. Now, morale goes down when you're not making progress towards your obje objective. That's to help encourage you to not run around the map farming absolutely everything you can and getting way, way overpowered for your quest. It's also to help kind of abstract the idea that quests have a timer. So they don't give you a timer. Instead, they give you this resource to manage. So if you can get around that, by all means, have fun running around, running around the wasteland. So if we were to go, say, over to this node, we would start to lose a bit of morale because our quest is this way and we just spent days going in the wrong direction. Not good for morale. We also have our day counter up here. 
and then we have each of our characters here. When you're moving around on the world map, you're going to find all of these sort of nodes like I mentioned. And sometimes there will be combats, but sometimes you'll also have little events where you have to make choices. And you can also run into wandering monsters. You may see a little group of characters like, like my characters are here, kind of wandering around. Some of them will try to get closer to you, and some of them are just sort of wandering around. You can engage them or avoid them as you wish. It's hard at first to know which monsters are strong and which ones aren't, but eventually you can kind of like, you, you know, you might see a little standee for a monster that looks like some sort of flame demon, and you might think to yourself, oh, I don't know what that is. I'm going to stay away from that thing, which is probably a good idea. So the next thing I want to go into is the decks. The decks in this game will... I want to say that they'll stay small and efficient, but that's not strictly true. And the reason for that is because each character's deck is only nine class cards so they have right here you can see class so there are nine class cards in here we have a basic advance move two and gain one willpower now willpower is like mana so this is a great card because you get to move and then also gain one point of energy that you can use for various other things that we'll talk about in our first combat we have here a basic swipe melee attack two we have a bunch of those we have a power adrenaline here we have a Wild Swing. This is a costly card that can do a lot of damage. So these are our class cards. These are basic. And this game, the name of this game is replacing these with better cards. You won't spend a lot of time upgrading your basic starting cards. You will want to replace them with better class cards and then upgrade those class cards. That's just my tip. You will also get cards granted to you from your equipment. So if we hover over this here, Bone Armor, Defensive stance is a power that this is granted to her. So it's a power she can apply to herself in combat as a card play, and it gives her extra defense after attacking. If we replace this armor or take it off, it comes out of here. So her deck in combat is now leaner, but she doesn't get the bonuses of the gear. So that's something you have to keep in mind. You can have a lean deck, but you also will lose benefits from powerful gear. And the gear in this game is fun and awesome because they grant all of these awesome cards. Unlike most of these kind of games, the gear doesn't really grant you a lot of stats it's mostly about the the actions and stuff you get from the cards that can be very very powerful like this charge here move three melee attack two plus extra damage for each space you move for two a single card that's a great action there that's way better than a one mana attack two because um, this is multiple actions and potentially more than two damage maybe five damage that's a really good card and so you can see each character has here, she can wear these types of armor. I assume this is heavy and medium. And then she, she has a helmet slot, a bracer or a shield. She can have a sword or a hammer. She can have a sword or an ax. So she could have multiple melee weapons. You can kind of see them on her back here. And she can have a, a bag item or a consumable item. Other characters will have different things. This character has some sort of grimoire, uh, some sort of grimoire, and then this sort of pentagram symbol. She has a dagger or a long knife here, a scepter or a hammer, another book slot here, and she seems to have, um, I don't know what kind of armor this is, but then she's got like light armor. So you can see the different characters can't all use all the different types of equipment. Similarly here we have ranged weapons like bows, a staff, lots of slots for consum some consumables. That makes sense as an alchemist. And in fact, I love his art actually. That's super cool having all these little like potions and stuff hanging off of him. And consumables in this game are great because they aren't consumable at all. You use them, you put them in your deck uh, on your character as equipment and then they just get that in combat like you might have a flask of acid that you throw and that's one of your cards that's just in your deck and that's that's awesome so if we go back in here really quickly and take a look there's a couple other things going on we have our level ups here they're all going to be level one um, we have our stats over here so we have cards in your deck that deal direct damage cards in your deck that allow you to move cards in your deck that allow you to gain defense power cards in your deck which are like they're like enchantments or, or semi-permanent buffs. And then we have cards in your deck that increase your willpower when played. So we can see she's very heavily weighted towards attacking with some, with some movement. And then she has not much of the other things. This character here, similar, lots of attacking. No defense at all, it looks like. Instead, we have cards that, that inflict negative effects on your enemies. 
and here we have similarly no defense. Uh, we have attacking, we have, what's this one? Utility cards. And this one is, they allow you to draw additional cards. Interesting. So we've got very different focuses on these characters. Obviously, they all have quite a lot of attacks. You can see their total cards in deck here as well. 11, 11, and 11. Up here, we have armor and quality. Armor obviously comes mostly from your equipment. Armor is extra health. So each point of armor provides one additional health at the start of every battle. So this is a basically temporary health buffer that you have in every fight and high or low morale can affect armor. So we have plus one from being determined and two from our bone armor here. So when we go into a fight, Jara the warrior, she will have 13 health in combat. So if I take three or less damage to her health, when she gets out of the combat, she will have full health. Her armor will have absorbed all of that damage. But down here, we only have one point of armor on our Elementalist and two on our Alchemist. So they have a, a much less forgiving level of armor. And in fact, she has zero. This is only from her determined status of her morale. We also have quality. Now, equipment quality provides redraws in battle. So if you have high equipment quality, so you can see here, cloth rags have a quality of one and Shaman Rod has a quality of none. This is probably getting from our morale. Yeah, plus one from the morale from Determined. Redraw can be used to discard and redraw any number of cards from hand. It's very, very useful to have this because if you have a bad selection of cards, this can really save the day. So equipment quality and equipment armor changes how you play this game. It takes some of the RNG out of the game by giving you forgiving little extra bit of health that isn't real and some redraws if your hand is bad. And those are things that I can really appreciate in a, in a roguelite, roguelite game. We also have over here our total um, resources. This is where all of our backpack stuff will go. So these three characters can hold this many slots worth of items. So we have a maximum number of slots. There will also be some other sort of crafting equipment that will go on down here that doesn't count towards your like carrying capacity. But if you have, you know, an extra set of armor or something like that that you're hanging on to because you might want to upgrade it later or just your spoils that you're going to sell when you get back to town, those all go in here. We just don't have anything yet. Over here in our journal page, we have our main objective and our side quests, which of course we just have this main objective right now that's got some sort of, what is this, like a spider of some kind? I'm not sure what this is. And then we can head on back to the map. So you gotta be careful here, you don't wanna click because if you click your party will start moving there um, immediately. Uh, right mouse doesn't do anything on here, it's left mouse to move around. So I think what we'll do is we might just kinda take a few steps down this way and you can see there, my determined meter, if you watch this, it's heading downwards just a little bit every few steps because I'm not headed towards my objective. But I do want to kind of check this out and then head along here and check out all those other things. So let's just head on down here. Hopefully we don't cross into a, a lower threshold here. What is this? You approach a gargantuan stone gateway built into the side of the mountains ahead. Jara concludes that this must be the gateway to the cavern known as the Underworld. And if you want more information, here it is. As you approach, you hear a rattling shriek coming from the crags by the right-hand column. It seems a monstrous creature has made a lair at the bottom of the column. We could confront the spike back, a battle, get a legendary reward and some food, or there's enough room to sneak around through the gate, so try to avoid a confrontation. This looks pretty deadly, um, but we might do it just because it'd be pretty fun to win a legendary reward fight right off the bat and also it'd be hilarious if I died in the first fight. So I think we're gonna do this. So as you can see, again, it's like the whole thing is in this book. So it starts out in that sort of off-white color and then everything springs up like somebody's been placing little miniatures. This is a strong monster. This is a problem. Um, this is kind of like a mini boss, and you can tell because the token is really big and special looking. Also has a lot of health. Um, so this is <laughs> this is a kind of got myself into a bit of a of a problem fight here right away. So we will call this episode to a close here. I know it's a bit of a cliffhanger, but come on back for the next episode. That'll be episode one. Um, again, this is episode zero. So episode one, the next one will be the combat tutorial. We will talk about how we're gonna play this 
uh, this game and like how we take our turns, how we spend our mana, how we get into position and fight this monster. So thank you everybody so much for joining. I hope you're going to enjoy this playthrough of Trials of Fire. It's a very, very fun game, atmospheric, and has some really great art. And I love how it kind of looks like we're playing like D&D or some sort of other miniatures game where we're kind of got these little tokens that represent our characters on this board that we set up and we're going to move around and, and battle. And then the book closes back up, back to the map. Really, really cool concept for this game. So please consider liking and subscribing if you enjoyed this video. And I will see everybody for episode one where we will fight this boss that hopefully doesn't kill me. See you then.